أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين Dear respected viewers, dear viewers of the Imam Hussein TV network Thank you for joining us live from the holy city of Karbala You're joining me, your host Yahya Seymour for this continuation of our show back to the basics in which we discuss the basics of our doctrinal theological jurisprudential and ethical foundations in addition to a framework by which we may be able to discuss with those of the opposing ideologies and sects and when i say opposing here i don't necessarily mean that every such individual is an opponent but rather that they belong to a theological or ideological persuasion which is different to our own and therefore may feel the need to interrogate, challenge and question our beliefs. In the previous few episodes we have of course been discussing several key themes pertaining to the building blocks and the ability to build a bunker, a general package, a general framework by which we interpret our religious beliefs by which we analyze how do we maintain these religious beliefs and what is the best way for us to view our religion. Of course, in the previous few episodes, I introduced the concept known as the world view, that every belief, every ideology, every religion tends to be composed of what we would call a world view. Now, I defined a world view for those of you who have may, may have forgotten. Inshallah, ta'ala, I'm only going to remind everyone for the next few episodes. Uh, my tongue gets tired of repeating it. but. A worldview is, of course, an interconnected set of beliefs pertaining to us, the universe, our man, our experiences, and essentially an interconnected set of beliefs connecting the bigger questions about life and how we are to interact with them. Of course, in light of that, I had mentioned that there are several key tools that we want to look at when looking at any worldview. Number one, what is its view in regards to God? Number two, what is its view in regards to man? Is man intrinsically evil? Is he intrinsically good? Maybe a bit of both. What's its view in regards to knowledge and how we ascertain knowledge and what we can trust about knowledge? Is it like the scientific, materialistic, empiricist worldview, which believes that our only source of knowledge is indeed that which we can detect with the five senses? That is to say, our sight, our hearing, our ability to smell, our ability to touch and our ability to taste? Or are we able to trust our rationality? These were all great and important questions. And of course, we gave several tools which are used in interrogating and interpreting, looking at the superior worldview when digesting these different topics. Some of them, just to remind you all, were number one, is the worldview consistent? Is it consistent with itself? or is it consistent with the other beliefs that it holds? That is to say, as the Qur'an states, if anyone is in doubt as to what has been revealed by Allah Azawajal, then had it been from anyone other than Allah, they would have found in it much inconsistency. Inconsistency within itself, why? Because inconsistency is a natural fingerprint for something which is deficient and not from God. So if you find a set of beliefs is inconsistent with your experience of the world, it's inconsistent with reality, then know that your worldview is false. It's explanatory scope. How much of this world and our experiences that we see in day-to-day -day life can our worldview explain? This is, of course, another great question that we need to ask. How much of our experience does, does this worldview account for? That's number one. How does this worldview's ethics resonate with the fitrah or the innate disposition of mankind? Is the worldview livable? Is it fulfilling? And does it provide hope? These were some of the tools we spoke about yesterday. Now, I mentioned yesterday that I want you to analyze the following question. If we are to continue discussing worldviews, if we are to have discussions with anyone, anyone that shares a different ideology, different set of beliefs from our own, what would mark the first place or the first thing that we would need in order to have such a discussion with them? Number one, I mentioned, of course, was the intellect. In order for us to be able to have any discussion with anyone, well, first we'd need a life, we'd need existence, we'd need bodies, we'd need minds, we'd need tongues to be able to discuss. 
But more importantly, we'd need a mind which is able to digest what is being said and what is being read. And so we spoke about how several worldviews in the world can be disqualified from the very inception because they call us to doubt in the very human ability to reason. What I call playing Russian roulette with all six bullets loaded, or essentially philosophically beheading yourself because essentially what you're doing is coming up with a rational framework, then telling someone you can't trust for rationality. Of course, this was something that I pointed out several worldviews do actually do. Yesterday, I cited the example of a Christian apologist who happens to be someone I'm, I'm slightly friends with, Richard, who said that he trusts his mind to get him to the belief in God, but then when it comes to the Trinity and the incarnation of God in his worldview, he suspends his reason because who is he and what is his reason to question the wisdom of God? Now, of course, this was not something unique to Richard. We gave the example of Richard and this Christian worldview that he belongs to because we wanted to show that, look, these poor individuals, in order to justify their belief set, in order to perpetuate that unfortunate, deficient, inconsistent, and quite frankly, shortcoming, lacking set of beliefs, we find that they are willing to shoot themselves in the foot and philosophically behead themselves, betraying the very ability to even continue a rational discussion because they want to hold on to that deficient worldview of theirs. And so we've mentioned that the intellect is one of the most important things. Another thing which we mentioned just now in any discussion we would need pertaining to a worldview which ties into the intellect, and that's why I'm mentioning it just now, inshallah ta'ala, is the concept of language the ability to communicate. Now, why does this tie into our discussion of worldview today? What does this relate to in our discussion pertaining to the intellect? You find that in any language, there are certain ways of speaking. There are certain terms used, certain expressions used, which might betray the apparent meaning that someone who's first learning that language for the first time might take in. So, for example, if you take the linguistic expression used commonly in the English language, it's raining cats and dogs. Or in Scotland, we have a slightly different expression, but it's a bit, it's a bit too crude, so I'm not going to use it, inshallah ta'ala. But it would literally take um, a very foul process done by human beings on a daily basis, and we would use that word. But that's not the word we want to be using. We're going to stick to it's raining cats and dogs, inshallah ta'ala. If we take it's raining cats and dogs, and we take that particular expression, and we were to bring in a foreigner that's learned the language fairly well, but he's not studied literal idioms, what's he going to understand from that particular term? And what would he be justified in understanding from those particular words? he would be justified in understanding from this particular expression that perhaps someone had been throwing dogs and cats outside of a window, perhaps in a divine catastrophe, a miraculous event, dogs and cats started hailing down from the skies. Perhaps there was a plane which was transporting a set of domesticated animals and from the skies rained down those domesticated animals, be they cats and dogs. And he would be justified in understanding that. Why? Because on the apparent, it's accurate. But then, if he were to see the reality and see that, no, it was just raining heavily, he would be forced to reinterpret what that statement meant and, understood, and understand that a literal idiom was being used. Likewise, anyone that hears certain expressions saying things like, it's hot as hell today, they might literally take that literally and be like, wow, this man must have been to hell before in order for him to understand how hot hell really is. But then we understand that no, this is just a metaphor. This is not something that is literally being meant. We don't literally mean that it is as hot as the fires of Jahannam. Or when we say it's as cold as hell today, we don't literally mean that there's a part of Jahannam which is as cold as the pathetic temperature that we experience in the winters of the Western world. This is not what's meant. This is symbolic language. And so any rational mind understands that languages include symbols and symbolism. And that's something I wanted to come back to in our discussion of the intellect and those who refuse to allow the intellect to judge 
and would rather reduce the role of the intellect in order to justify their theological set of beliefs. In interpreting scriptures, interpreting religious texts, given that they are written within a framework of human language, languages which already existed. Now, some atheists create problems about this. Why didn't God create a new language? The reason God didn't create a new language was because he wanted everyone to understand his scripture. And the scriptures were sent to people that had fallen away from the tracks of belief. And so the scriptures were revealed in their languages, in the languages that those people happened to follow. In the case of the Jahili Arabs, they had reached the peak of the Arabic language and were more than familiar with what the Arabic language meant. And so we understand that they had even had a comprehensive understanding of literal metaphors, metaphors that we can find in their poetry today when we look at the Jahili poetry which still survives until this day. And these metaphors need to be understood in light of what? We give a particular framework which states the following. When scripture contradicts rationality, as we have it, I've already stated that Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon Imam al-Sadiq, Sadiq Ali Muhammad, this individual, the sixth holy Imam, the sixth successor of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who states that the aql, the intellect, is that by which ar-Rahman, the merciful, one of the names of Allah Azza wa Jal, is worshipped. So when he gives this high status to the intellect, what we understand from this is if we have any text which on the apparent surface reading contradicts the intellect, then the intellect must be given primacy because you have only three options. Either you've misunderstood the text and the text truly is from God, or you've understood the text and the text is not from God, or it's impossible for anyone to understand that text or you haven't understood the text. But if you have understood that text and the apparent meaning is something which is rationally absurd, something which could never be affirmed by any rational human being, then we would be forced to say that there must be an alternative explanation within the linguistic capabilities and possibilities of that particular word, within what we would call the semantical do domain of that word utilized. And if the primary meaning contradicts our rationality and therefore cannot be from God, we must search within that semantical domain and find is there any other possible meanings which could possibly be utilized here which do not contradict the intellect. This is of course sound reasoning and how one would apply their reason in order to understand how we should interpret divine scripture. And of course, interpreting divine scripture is important because it is the very crux of our religion and for where we get our doctrines. Dear viewers, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go for a very short break. I need to take a sip of water, inshallah ta'ala, but we'll be right back after that. Assalamualaikum dear viewers, thank you for allowing me to take that short break. As I was saying, any discussion pertaining to religious texts, to the way we interpret scripture, is extremely important. And it is through this methodology that we would see which methodology truly respects the intellect. I quoted yesterday a very prominent Salafi persuasion internet forum which tends to adopt a standard higher than the average internet polemical forum. That is to say, it is moderated by people who are considered at the very least students of knowledge and therefore conduct themselves with the etiquette and morality of a student of knowledge. It's not filled with profa profanity, nor insults, nor basic vile and bile that you find on an average internet forum. Let me quote what is stated by one of the scholars who is an admin on this website. The website is, of course, called Mutlaqa Ahlil Hadith. It states the following. Haytham Hamdan, one of the scholars on their website, he states, The position of the Salaf 
and by this he means the Salaf al-Saleh, which according to him is the first three generations of Muslims. His ultimate standard for looking back to in terms of knowledge. He states about them, the position of the Salaf is simply that our great Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has a form that is suitable to his majesty. Now, of course, I've already asked, what does the word forum mean in the English language? In the English language, forum is to have a very distinct image. It's to have a distinct set or basic, basic limitations which make you distinct from something else. So what does it mean to say that Allah Azza wa Jal has basic distinctions which befit His Majesty? I quoted someone that is normally of the utmost intelligence and someone I must truly commend for I know him personally and he's a man of great akhlaq even though we disagree heavily on Islamic concepts. His name is Basam Zawadi, a Salafi who's known out for debating with Christians and others and even debating with Muslims of other theological persuasions. He states the following, and I quote again as I quoted last night. Christian philosophers, and I'm assuming Ash'ari philosophers, by Ash'aris he means the majority of those who call themselves Sunni, will argue that Allah is like an unembodied mind. Thus arguing that Allah does not have a form. However, just because Allah does not have a body, that does not necessitate that he doesn't have a form. These are Basam Zawadi's words. Even Casper the Friendly Ghost in the cartoons has a form, yet no body. So if our limited minds could imagine this for the creation, then what about the creator? Allah, subhanAllah. Are all the viewers following this? If our limited minds can attribute to Casper the Friendly Ghost a body, a form without a body rather, and he's a creation, he's a creation of the human mind, then Basam Zawadi argues, why couldn't we imagine this for the creator? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. We seek the refuge of Allah from such thoughts, comparing Allah Azza wa Jal to a cartoon and to, to claim that it's an act of greatness of ta'zeem to be able to assume that Allah can have a form without a body because we can do so with this fictional child's humorous cartoon. My friend, if you want to hold cartoons as a basic source of your theology, then please don't expect the rest of the Muslims to do it. This is disgusting. And it's quite frankly something which is a bit of a joke that we are bringing such discussions into the remit of classical rational theology. When we talk about the theological schools of Islam, there was never a day where we could imagine that this would be done with Allah Azza wa Jal. He continues to state, if Allah does not have a form, then what are we going to look at on the day of judgment? The Prophet said we will see Allah as clearly as the moon on a cloudless night. How on earth does that happen if Allah has nothing of himself for us to see? So we see that the ultimate binding factor here is that they have a narration, the narration states one thing, and therefore Basam Zawadi and the Salafis would rather restrict the remit of the intellect and go with the apparent meaning of a narration, which of course contradicts the intellect, because they want to follow the apparent meaning of the narrations. This is exactly something we see as well with the so-called Salafi theologian who makes a big effort to elaborate and clarify that he is a theologian to the world. His name is Dr. Yasser Qadi a graduate from, I believe, Yale University and a theologian, for those of you who are not aware. Yasser Qavi states in one of his papers, which is available online, entitled The Theological Implications of the Story of Ibrahim and the Stars. Of course, he's referring to Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and the great narrative in the Quran, the great story in which Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in order to establish a hujjah upon his people, falsifies the fake belief that the star, the moon, and the sun are deities worthy of worship. In this paper, Yasser Qavi compares Ibn Taymiyyah to the rational theologians. And what he states is that this proof that the rational theologians have given, namely the proof of the 
motion of bodies, celestial bodies, and the movement being something which cannot be an attribute of Allah, that this rational argument is not something we can use based upon the Quranic story and we should not entertain such rational arguments in order to prove Allah's existence. What is the crux of Yasser Qavi's, Dr. Yasser Qavi, the theologian, what is the crux of his argument and why he believes it is a deficient argument for Muslims to use? His argument is that the Quran does not use this argument, even though the whole paper questions whether or not this Quranic anecdote is a use of the argument. And more importantly, that it is not from the minhaj of what he calls the Salaf al-Salih, the first three generations to utilize such a methodology. I'm sorry. Just because the Salaf al-Salih did not utilize this argument does not make it a non-sound rational argument that can be used for calling people to the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal. The Imams of the Ahlul Bayt have respected the human intellect enough to say that we are the ones who give you the principles and it is upon you to branch out and expand those principles. The Imams give us the usul wa alayna and nufarra. It is upon us to branch out those principles that the Imams have given us, rational principles. But with someone like Dr. Yasir Qavi, he would rather just stick to, well, the classical first three generations did not use this argument and therefore we are also now not going to use this argument. But what are the complications of such a statement? As I mentioned earlier, we quoted my friend Bassam Zawadi and their approach when it comes to what we call the Sifat al khabariyah those attributes of described terms describing certain attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. So in the Quran you might find a statement saying that the hand of Allah is above the hands of the believers when they give bay'ah, when they give allegiance. When you find such a statement, the ultimate ipso facto default position of the Salafi movement is to say we do not look at what this word means, we accept it without discussing how. We affirm the literal meaning, so they affirm that Allah has a hand. Again, not taking into account the usage of metaphor. Let me give a very, very quick analogy of how this can sometimes turn slightly foul, my brothers and sisters, not respecting the intellect. One of our scholars, Allawi bin Abdul Qadir al saqaf who of course is Yemeni in origin, describes in his book called The Attributes of Allah or Sifat Allah, he states in volume 1, page 232, al harwala Al-Harwala Sifatun fi'liyatun khabariyatun thabitun lillahi azza wa jal bil hadith al-sahih That the attribute He states that the attribute of running is one of the attributes of Allah azza wa jal and that this attribute is thabit is necessarily proven to be an attribute of Allah due to a sahih Hadith. And of course that Sahih Hadith is found in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's narrated from Abu Huraira. And what they say here is that Allah Azza wa Jal runs, but his running is not like the running of human beings. SubhanAllah. There are many such examples of these beliefs. These beliefs which really perplex and confuse the human mind as to how this is being attributed as being the purest form of Tawheed. Lillahi alayk. When, when we talk to the Christians, when, when those who have a very simple understanding of Christian theology debate with Christians, what do they say? They say, how can be Jesus be God when he did things like eat and sleep and drink? All human attributes. Can you imagine that the Christian would turn around and say, but you see, he ate and sleep and drank in a way which was befitting of his majesty. We would not accept this answer from them. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, when it comes to this debate, when it comes to looking at a worldview, when it comes to looking at our intellects, we need to respect our intellects. We'll continue with this topic in the next few episodes, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you once more for joining me, dear viewers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>